Craig Anthony Harper. Welcome <laughs> yeah. to Roll With The Punches. Oh, bloody, how good is it to be here? I, I didn't know what to wear. You know, I got up early. I was flicking through my fucking wardrobe, <laughs> looking left and right. So I've gone with the green flannel and the black T-shirt underneath, which is a bit on trend, apparently. You look really lovely. Isn't it? Why does it feel so different? <laughs> anyway. I don't know. It's weird, isn't it? Hey, everyone. <laughs> welcome to Roll With The Punches. I'm... A guest on Tiff's show couldn't be happier. <laughs> Coming up next, it's more of Tiff. <laughs> Here's the funny thing that happens, I'll tell everyone, because I like to overshare. Well, <laughs> I'm getting you on the show and it's all different. Yeah. And, I, and I'm picking the topic and I was really excited. I, I was walking yesterday and I was thinking about some topics popped into my head and I was like, this is interesting. I might do an episode with Craig on that. And I was really into it, really into the thoughts. <laughs> and then... The time comes around real quick. We pencil this in, and then last night I was like, "Shit, I got to... And then I get all over in my head about it, and more so when it's with you. <laughs> more so, we're like, what, how stupid is that? You know, and isn't annoying. It, but isn't it funny how the mind gets in the way of our ability and our potential? Now, how many conversations have you and I had on and off air? Well, a thousand. Yeah. And so this is number one thousand and one, so to speak. <laughs> And the, it's like, it's not like you can't, of course you can do this, but it's like when, yeah, we tell ourselves a story and all of a sudden it's not the same, it's different and I've got to perform and shit, I hope I ask good questions and, and it's not me bouncing off him, it's me running the show and he's just there. How does this work? It's funny too, right? Because I think, because I know you so well and we have talked so much about so much and probably a lot of the stuff that I'm going to want to talk about today, we've talked about it before. There's not much we haven't. But still, there's this weird difference in, it's like my mind accesses a different place. If you were a complete stranger, mm. I, would, I wouldn't be planning anything. I just, funnily enough that I even went to say this, I just know that I was going to ask the right questions. And th when I tell you what this podcast is about, you'll think that's a hilarious statement. Because initially, I was really intrigued in emotional intelligence and I was starting to go down some rabbit holes on my walk the other day about emotional intelligence. And then I went down that rabbit hole. And then I did a post last night in my Roll With The Punches page on Facey just about some thoughts about after interviewing a guest that you happen to know or that we found out afterwards, we talked a lot about knowing and I was mm. like, that's an interesting concept, isn't it? This idea of knowing, when we just mm. know things. Mm. And so I put a post up about that and got a bit of a conversation going. And then I went, nah, that's what I'm going to do my podcast on. So we're doing it now. You should probably tell everyone, I don't know what we're talking about. But guess what? Sometimes talking, you just know, Harps. We're, we're knowing. We're talking <laughs> about knowing. We're talking about knowing. Are you talking about the kind of knowing that we know without knowing why we know that knowing? That's the knowing. That's yeah, the that's the best knowing, isn't it? How do you know stuff? Isn't it interesting how just, you know, what is that? Like, yeah. is it is it spiritual? Is it instinct? Is it intuition? Is it innate? Is it something that we've learned over the, the evolutionary timeline of being us and all this wisdom gets passed down through the generations and we don't know and then it just turns itself on when we need it? Yeah. I love all this shit. It's so interesting. Yeah. And why do we access it sometimes and not others? And it's sometimes in seemingly the same situation. I think this is my metaphor. I reckon that let's just call it your internal sat nav. Well, that's what I call it. I call that wisdom, that knowledge, that understanding, that awareness, that insight that, that I can't explain. Like I haven't been taught it. I haven't been told it. I haven't read it. I haven't heard it somewhere. For me, that's that, you know, I call it my internal sat nav and that's kind of my guidance system. But for me, it's always there and always whispering, mm. always whispering. But I pay attention to the yelling of the world, the shouting, <laughs> the screaming, yeah. Yeah. like because we're in the middle of a lot of noise trying to sometimes listen to a whisper and you've got to be very present and you've got to be very aware and you've got to be very, I think, in tune. Mm. Here's a few questions I've got. I'm ready. I'm ready. Can we know? Can we know something or tap into our knowing 
at times when, because sometimes we do and sometimes we, sometimes we don't, but at times when we don't have a deep level of trust in ourselves? Um, well, I, I think so. That When you say, do, okay, can I just define we don't have a deep level of trust? Do you mean we doubt ourselves, self-doubt? Yeah. So if I know something, I am trusting. It. There's no one else but me and I'm not even leaning on any external mm. evidence. Mm-hmm. I'm just going, mm. I know this. I knew when COVID hit and the outside world told me that I was in a vulnerable position and it was bad news for me. I had a knowing that I talked about in videos. I said, I know, and I don't know what it's going to look like, but I know and, it, and I have comfort in knowing there's something really good is going to come mm. out of this situation. See, okay, now this is, all right, let's, before I answer that, or before we unpack that, let's unpack this idea of knowledge. Mm. So knowledge in, in Western academic kind of logical thinking, knowledge is something that we've acquired along the way through exposure or experience or observation or education, right? That's knowledge. It's like, well, we have this knowledge. And I don't know that when we talk about that kind of knowledge versus your kind of knowledge that we're talking about the same thing, Mm. right? So I think, and this is the semantics of the human language, right? Is when I say, that was a great day. And you say that was a great day. We're probably talking about different experiences. <laughs> and then when someone else goes, that was a great day, they're talking about something. And this is, this is, it, this is hard to understand the nuance of, cause we use the same word, but yeah. we're not talking about the same thing. And that's where the confusion comes. You make a really good point because I don't identify knowing with knowledge. I think I feel like they're two completely different things well knowledge is the the noun (laughs) knowing is the adjective and knowledge is the noun they're the same one's just a a doing word and one is a a, this is what it is word and isn't that weird because i have a completely different concept of both for me when you say knowledge i go science proven facts yes things that are in it like that i can show you yes and you say knowing and i'm like that's a to me that's a, a sense I can't yes. even describe it. Yes. And and that is, see, and, I mean, here's the thing, right? You know, 70,000 thoughts a day. My thoughts are not yours. Yours are not mine. Reality is subjective. Everyone listening to this now, some people are going, this is fucking brilliant. Some people are going, fuck, I've got to listen to Joe Rogan. I've got to go. <laughs> some people are going, fucking hell, what are these two weirdos <laughs> on about? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like this is the human experience is trying to understand not only others, and the mindset of others and the reality of others, but even my own, like, what do I mean when I say, you know, I use internal sat nav as a kind of an umbrella term for a bunch of things that for me reflect this level of awareness or intuition or instinct or whatever Mm. that I can't really explain in a way which will resonate or click with everyone because that is literally impossible because nobody is in the same identical reality as me, cognitively, emotionally, physically right now. So what you do and I do, or we try to do, is we try to express our thoughts and ideas in a way that will resonate optimally with as many people as possible while knowing that it won't land with everyone. Yes. Yeah. You know, and that's your, and you're becoming more knowing and more knowledgeable. But I think, look, we almost need you and I to invent like a, a second, you know, so version one, so knowledge, the knowing that comes with the things that I've been taught and told and trained and and by my parents and my peers and my school and my research and my, you know, my extensive uh, degree in YouTube, um, you know, and then on top of that, here's a shit that I don't even know how I know it, but it's just there. And not always, but most of the time it true proves to be true. And, you know, we've, I think most people have had some freaky experiences that make no sense in inverted commas logically, but something happened or we had a, a forewarning and knowledge and insight that, is inexplicable from a logical point of view. Can knowing get tangled with the combination of something we deeply devo- desire, deeply desire, 
and feel motivated to work towards. So how, it, how does that situation oh. differ to a knowing? If I deeply desire something and feel mm. motivated to act on that, so I'll go and get it, how's that different to just a, a knowing? Oh, <clears throat> okay. So, th by the way, everyone, this is just a conversation. <laughs> this is, this is, this is, fucking hell, she's asking me some hard questions. The unanswerable oh. questions. Come well, here, here's what I think. <laughs> we all have stories of, and, and the, the, the challenge with our stories is like our oh, tips, this tips, that, or Craig's this or that, or the government or COVID or, you know, so there's what's actually happening. And then there's our story of what's happening, but we don't see the difference between the two. Mm. So it's, it's, you know, and there's things that I want to be, um, you know, it's like how many times have people said over the years, oh, you know, I know, I know he's going to be all right. I know he'll survive. I know, I know. And he doesn't. And that's sad and that's tragic, but that's also a reality of the human experience. Mm. And so there's often things that we think we know uh, that we don't. And, and sometimes there's that, there's that, I want this to be true. So I'm going to speak as though it is true. And then there's the whole positive affirmation thing and I'm going to breathe life into it. And what I'm, I'm thinking in my head, I'm creating in my body. And so it is a very, um, it is a very gray area sometimes, I guess. Um, and look, I don't even, you know, even with the intuition and the insight and the awareness and the shit that I know without knowing how I know it, you know, there's that you go, well, maybe this is a construct of my mind. Like I Craig Harper, I don't want it to be because that, that fucks up my theory of what I think. And my ego doesn't want to be wrong. But is it possible that this guy who has a spiritual life and spiritual beliefs and values and wants to live an aligned life and all of that, is it possible that he, why is he talking in the third person, but is it possible that he's completely fucking wrong? Well, if I really want to live my values, I have to say, yeah, I could be totally wrong. And that's, that's hard because I don't want to be wrong. Humans, we don't want to be wrong. That's why we love echo chambers. That's why we love confirmation bias. That's why we only pay attention to people who agree with us or sound like us because we want to be right. Mm. Um, and, and I think that is a whole level of a vulnerability and awareness that is, uh, that requires courage where you go, look, this is what I think, but I could be in, in fact, this is what I believe passionately, but I could be wrong. I reckon I've come to a place where I am really comfortable with a, the awareness on choosing that something to be a construct of my mind. So when I talk about knowing and think about it at times, I think what's the, what's the benefit of allowing what I'm thinking about right now to be a knowing to me? What's the benefit? Well, the benefit mm. is creativity, courage, action, feeling supported. There's all of these benefits, which you're only going to have a positive outcome. Mm. Um, or even they might have a negative outcome, but we know the benefit of failure. So if mm. a knowing makes me feel comfortable, take action, take risk, and then I learn something from it or I get more resilient. Mm. So I, I, I think about that a lot about how I used to try and find an external source to tell me right or wrong, truth mm. or lie. Yes. Or try and ask Craig Harper, tell me if yes. I know something, how do I know yes. if I know it? And now yes. I'll listen to people and go, I'm going to listen to you and see how it feels and sits. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to think about how that feeling impacts me and my choices moving forward as to whether I'm going to believe or not believe this. Perfect example of metacognition is you're starting to think about how you think. Yeah. You're starting to separate their thoughts from your thoughts. You're starting to take ownership. Do people do that at like six years old or something? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's theory of mind. Theory of mind when people start to become well, aware that not everyone thinks like beyond. them. Usually it's about four years old, I think. But, but, you know, what you're doing, which is great, is you're starting to genuinely think for yourself. And also in the thinking for yourself, you're becoming aware of your own bias. Like to become aware of your own bias and prejudice and programming, one, that is fucking hard. Mm. Uh, and two, that is uncomfortable. And three, that is vulnerable because you have to admit that 
all the shit that I think could be wrong. And when you get your sense of who I am from the shit that you think, which is most people, fucking hell, that's a dangerous place to be. Because if I've believed in X, Y, Z for 30 years and X, Y, Z is bullshit or partly bullshit, then who am I? Because it and I are the same thing. We are intertwined. Now, I'm going to open a philosophical door for you, my young friend. And that is this. This is what I reckon is the best question so far. The best question is, why the fuck do I need to know? Mm. Why can't I be comfortable not knowing? Why am I addicted to have to know? Why can I just think or I can believe? But maybe, see, I believe in things that I can't prove. I believe that when I die, something more than just this, I don't know if it's heaven, if it's hell, if it's just it's I turn into a fucking worm, I don't know. <laughs> I, I just, I, but... I am also well aware that I could literally just go into the ground, decompose and become part of the earth. I'm very aware of that. And I'm also aware that maybe I believe what I believe because it's comfortable for me. Maybe because I grew up in a religious paradigm that says this is not all there is, there's more. Maybe that's what's influencing that. So, but here's the thing, I don't know. I don't know if people are going to love this or hate this conversation. I don't know, but I'm in the middle of it. I don't know what happens when I die. I don't know what happened. You know, my friend, one of my best friends died 20 years ago, give or take. I don't know where he is or if he's anywhere. I still think of him. I still feel his energy. I still feel his presence. Now, whether or not that's real or that's a byproduct of my mind, the experience for me is the same. So I don't give a fuck. (laughs) I still feel love for Maddie. And I still feel energy and love from Maddie. So whether or not that's literal, whether or not that is, there is a presence, there is an energy that's around me that can impact me or whether or not I'm creating that with my mind, I'm like, I don't care. (laughs) I don't care. Mm. And I think there's, because we are very much addicted to certainty and knowing and familiarity and predictability, as you've heard me say a lot. I'm like, what if, what if you don't know? And what if that's okay? You know, you can have an idea or a thought. I've got lots of ideas and thoughts, but I'm also aware that I've got a million fucking things wrong over the last 40 years. And I'm still here. I'm still going. It's all right. You're allowed to get shit wrong. Yeah. This is the, you know, this is the screaming fucking matches that happen in our culture now where everyone's got to abuse everyone because if you don't agree with me and I'm, and it's like, fuck, really? How about we just be different and think different? How about you think A and I think B and it's all right? How, at what point did you start to consciously tap into your knowing or did you, for yourself, find it quite an innate thing always? So I was raised in a culture and a, and a, a home and a church and a school environment that, that was r- religious. So I had a a God curiosity, let's call it that. Now, whatever, whatever, whoever, whatever God represents to you, let's just use the God word. Um, So I was always curious about um, not, I didn't think about it this way, but I was always curious about what there was beyond what I could see and beyond what I was taught and told. I was always interested in, like, I always had, this sounds weird. I'm not very good at many things, but you know, I'm not bad at this. I was always good at figuring out adults as a child. I'm like, this, this grown up's lying. I, I knew when people were lying. I knew when people were trying to impress people. I knew when they were telling me what they thought they should tell me versus the truth. Mm. And so that, I don't know what that is, where that comes from, but I've always had that intuitive, instinctive ability to pay attention or to understand what they're really saying beyond the words. So that, that kind of, I think it's, I think that ability to know things that aren't being told to you I think that can be perhaps in the realm where we're talking about almost like a spiritual download, but I think there's a much more explainable uh, component to this as well, which is that I can read human behavior. I can read physiology. I can, I can interpret energy. I can, I can understand posture and, and cadence and timing and, and, 
um, you know, voice tone and all of those things where there's a real practical, logical part to I know what's going on with this person, which mm -hmm. is more sciencey. But then I think there is another component which these don't necessarily go together, which is, you know, I've told this story on my show, but not on yours. So I'll tell it here. So I had to do, um, I had to do a, I did some talk, some talks, some work with a, an addiction treatment facility. And one day I was walking down the corridor and I just went in each week and I spoke for two hours to a group and every week it was a different group or a different version of a group because people would come in and out. And I was walking down the corridor, which is just a dark kind of corridor. So no windows. And I couldn't see into the room that I was going into. And at the end of the corridor was just a normal door with a handle that you open and then boom, you're in the room. You're in the room with the group and there's the group. There's me. And I'm about to talk to them for two hours. And I'm walking down the corridor. I'm a meter away from the group. And it's almost like from the door, I almost get an electric shock. It's like something takes my breath away and makes me stop. And so I just stop. I'm about to turn the door handle and I just stop. And this is hand on heart. And I get this overwhelming sense of be careful. Be careful. Like this is potentially dangerous. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> and it's not like it was like God going, harps, pay attention. <laughs> you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a movie. But I just had this feeling. Morgan and it Freeman wasn't, wasn't there? And Morgan Freeman, fuck, I wish he was. How good would it? <laughs> I'd love him to just chime into my scone a couple of times a day with a couple of brilliant downloads. <laughs> you're available, Morgan, and you're listening. Um, and anyway, I walked in and it just so happened that there were a couple of um, people in the room who decided to make it pretty complicated and pretty difficult that way who were uh, on release from prison for a few things and... And it was just, ah, oh, it was a really interesting two hours of my life and who challenged me on everything and made it clear that they didn't want to be there and all of these things. And I'm like, oh, but I was prepared. And I was prepared because I knew that something was going to happen. How on earth, I can't explain that. And some people listening right now would go, don't believe you, that's bullshit. And I would say to you, I don't. I don't, uh, I, I understand. I understand that you think that that I completely understand. Cause if someone told me that I might go, that's bullshit. Um, but it was me and it happened. And I go, I don't know where that comes from. I don't know where that comes from. Nobody told me, nobody warned me. Nobody met me at the reception and said, look, they're a bit of a tough group, you know, steady on, or that didn't happen. So I, I don't know, but I do know that we, in 2022, we think we're the smartest we've ever been. Oh. Yet we still can't explain the fucking pyramids. <laughs> we can't explain Stonehenge. We can't, like, there's so much shit that we don't know. And what I, what I know is if we're still around in 50 years and who knows, cross our fingers because we're not going great at the moment as a bloody oh, planet. God. But let's hope we're around in 50 years. I am pretty positive that, in 2072, they will look back at what we called science in 2022 and go, how fucking dumb were they? <laughs> like those fucking dummies 50 years ago. That's what they thought. They thought that was real. This was science. Like, oh my God. And this has been, you know, forever. This skeptical part of our brain that overrides stuff. It's really funny because... I was talking to Kerry. So Kerry was on my show. You know Kerry. We didn't know you knew Kerry till afterwards. Keza, um, <laughs> shout out. And it was funny, right? So we had that scheduled a week ago and we got on and we had no internet and I made a joke that I was talking to an animal communicator and we couldn't communicate. We couldn't communicate via phone. We couldn't communicate via text. We couldn't hear each other on Zoom. We were like, well, this is funny. Mm. And we were both, and it was weird. It was like out of all the people that have that issue, that's funny. We got on, went on like a house on fire. We ended up on the Zoom call for two and a half hours. So we wow. did our potty and then we talked for an hour and a half, just chatting about stuff. When we had these little snippets of the conversation where we, we, she was like, I just knew that, you know, she talked about gigs that she got off, offered that she declined and she could, but she wanted to do this podcast. She goes, I just had a sense. And she goes, and I just, I knew, like I said, last week I wouldn't have had time for this chat. 
to I would have had time to sit here. I'd stuff on after. She goes, me too. And it's like we we both had this knowing, yeah, that we wanted to connect and. It was really interesting. And I told her a story. So she communicates with animals and it's it's quite a... It, for some people, they'll be like, bizarre, that's fucking weird. She literally tells a story where a wasp flies in front of her face and goes, look at the funny man. She turns around, there's a fucking dude walking down the street with helium balloons. So that's one of her first experience with animals talking to her. Wow. So I t- told her about after I lost coach and I was walking through the park and listening, as you do, as <laughs> in the middle of your writhing straight stages of grief i was listening to the song that i would put on that i'd found that i would put on coach's little video memorial video so i was listening to that on repeat and just happened to stroll through the dog doing? park I don't, you know I was just, what are you doing <laughs> are you trying to get more miserable I, and then i glance across to the center of the park and i see a couple of whippets running and that's it it's waterworks i'm crying i've got my noise cancelling headphones i know he can see me i've got glasses on but I stood and I turned to the centre of the park and I was just sobbing quietly and I was like, no one would know and I'm looking at the centre of the park and I just felt this sense behind me and I turned around and there's about 20 metres away, there's this little dog just incessantly barking at me and there and its owners were an extra 20 or 30 metres back and they were just kind of looking at it, just waiting and standing, looking like, what the hell is it doing? And, it was, and I looked back. Then I looked again and it was still barking at me and I couldn't hear it because I had the headphones on and I kind of giggled to myself and I just watched it for a bit and then I just took my headphones off and I just squatted and it ran up to me and it tapped its paws on my knee, did a circle and then just ran back to its owners and buggered off and I just went, that was a message from Coach. That That was Coachy telling me it's all right. Wow. And I told her that story and I know, like I knew at the time and I know when I tell it and I go, some people will be like, fucking you're right, are you just sad, mate? <laughs> just a bit sad, <laughs> just a dog barking at you. Yeah, they'll just tap you on the shoulder and no, <laughs> go, sure it was. No, that's okay, good for you. <laughs> but Kerry tells me that not only was it that she goes, coach was there beside you, the dog was looking to your left, the coach was there and she's telling me that but she couldn't tell you she needed the physical presence to come and pull you out of the grief like loop that you were in. Wow. And But even as I, she's telling me about the experience that I already know happened, there's part of my brain that was going, are you sure though? How do you know? Are you just tricking me? Like, what do you, what do you mean? Yeah. Like, how do you know that dog was next to me? Yeah. And so yeah. it's really interesting when we look at how, how we feel about no, I've always been interested in tarot readers or, or spiritual people and I've always wanted to go see one, but I don't trust anyone enough to go. I don't, I'm always like, yeah, but what if I get one of the shit ones and how will yeah. I trust them? Well, <laughs> I mean, the mind, the mind is a gift and the mind is, you know, an anchor at times. And, you know, see, see, when you say to me, I was at the park and then Kerry said this and the dog and blah, blah, blah. Part of my brain goes, yeah, righto. Yeah. Righto, sure. <laughs> right? Yeah. And that's because I'm programmed to be skeptical. Mm. We all are. Mm. But he- here's what I know. I don't know what the fuck is real and what's not half the time. I don't know. All I know is that I see things a certain way. That's the only thing I can be certain of in terms of my reality. So when you're telling me a story, which is a stimulus, like here's Tiff giving me some information. It's not about the information. It's about what I'm doing with that information and the meaning I'm giving it. And is it bullshit? Is it real? Is this her making herself feel better? And another lady who's trying, is it that? No, 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 Yeah. Right. And this is the whole, like, again, and like for some people, this will be like, oh, fuck too deep. But this is the metacognitive thing of, you know, being aware of how your metacognition is thinking about thinking. And this is starting to think about that. But also it is the awareness of, of what we're telling ourselves. But also there is this other component that we've spoken about, which has got nothing to do with the mind. It's, mm. it's beside the mind. It, it's insight, wisdom, awareness, knowledge, love, compassion, downloads that doesn't come from the mind. It's just the mind is just the, the conduit. Like it comes from, like I know, and this again, this is going to sound weird as well. I know, and you know, because you've seen me speak a lot. 
I can stand on stage and I can, I can talk to a lot of people and I can tap into my skill and my experience and my knowledge and my timing and my situational awareness, all of these measurable practical attributes that a good speaker will develop over time and then maximize in a moment to create a good outcome with an audience, right? That's all very practical, logical mind stuff. Then there's other times where I get up on stage and magic happens despite me. It's almost like I am not in control. I'm just here. And I'm saying shit sometimes. I don't know where it's coming from. I feel like it's coming through me, not from me. And of course, people will go, that's bullshit. I understand. Even I think it's bullshit and I'm the one saying it. But what (laughs) I know is I don't have to understand everything for it to be real because things don't, in inverted commas, make sense to me especially someone who's literally doing a doctorate in science. (laughs) It's like, I should be the most skeptical fuck in the world, but I can, I can live in science and I can live and I can be open to things that don't make sense inverted commas in science. Otherwise I'm just putting myself in another echo chamber. Now I'm in the science echo chamber or now I'm in the vegan echo chamber or now I'm in the spiritual echo chamber or the Carlton football club echo chamber. And this is, is trying to find ourselves um, in this space where we can be open enough and vulnerable enough to say, look, that could be real. It could be bullshit, but it could be real, but I don't understand it. And just like I've said to you, I can pick up my iPhone and and I can press some numbers and talk to Bobby who lives on the other side of the world (laughs) in real time with no delay. I could not even begin to explain from a tech point of view how the fuck that works. I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. It's not logical to me that I can't, but what I do know is I don't need to understand it to benefit from it. I don't need to understand the process or the tech to be able to have that interaction with that other being on the other side of the world. So why do I need to understand everything for it to be real? And there's so much that is real that I don't get. And if I think only the things that I understand are real, then I'm driven by ego and arrogance. Yeah. I think about um, like what states of uh, emotional states or, you know, neurological states can get in, can states get in the way of knowing? Mm. Does that have, does that come into play? Do we... I mean, I feel like it does because when you speak to someone who has tapped into their knowing, it's really about letting go and creating space and, and, and getting yourself into a state where you can feel things. And I don't think we're in a very feeling state of like, frame of mind most of the time. Mm. I, think, I think one of the challenges for all of us is that we are not just a spiritual being. We are not just a logical being. We are not just a social being, an emotional being, a physical being. We're all of it all of the time, you know, which is why I'll call someone a fuckwit at the traffic lights it, <laughs> because I'm out of control in that moment. I'm not tapped into my higher purpose. I'm just a rude prick because someone cut me off and, I haven't called anyone that for a long time, thankfully, but you know, this is the thing is that we are, it's like, for example, most people know how to eat well at the same time. Most people don't eat well, right? It's (laughs) not, it's not about our potential or our possibilities. It's about what we're doing with it. You know, it's, it's, I've got to manage my ego. I've got to manage my mind. I've got to manage my choices and my relationships and my words and my time and my energy and also my spiritual life or that, that part of me that I want to be the compelling force that steers my choices and my relationships. But because I have an ego that's never going anywhere and I have a mind that's never going anywhere, while they can both serve me positively, they can also hinder me you know so that's why i say the mind's a blessing of course thank goodness for the ability to think and reason and it's it's amazing but also there are times where the mind's going you're shit out you're not good enough they hate you this is this will never work 
It's your complex. Con- your conditioning in your upbringing gave you a really good springboard to trust knowing and to build that relationship with a, a faith. It doesn't have to be religious, but the, under- yeah. the, the, the context of that. Has stepping into the academic world so deeply the last few years, has that, have you noticed a change or is it something that you deliberately work on or because you have creative outlets, do you still feel balanced? Yeah, I feel balanced. I mean, for me, I, I still, look, I know I'm not, but I still feel like a fraud in academia, you know. <laughs> but that's where we talk about, you know, and I think this is encouraging for people is to, to know that you can simultaneously feel like a fraud or feel not something enough, whatever enough, fill in the blank, pretty enough, smart enough, good enough, worthy enough, you know, whatever, whatever that perceived gap is for you. You can simultaneously feel that while actually knowing intellectually that that's not true. Yeah. Like I know that I'm good enough. There's no ego in that. I just know that because I've done these things successfully many times. So I have evidence. Yeah. I have data, I have results, I have outcomes. I can look back and go, well, Craig, you've done more than I don't know how many, but well over a thousand present thousands of presentations, and you're still doing it and people are still paying you for it, and you're not the best in the world, but you're okay, right? So there's that evidence. Yeah. But that doesn't mean I won't walk out to do a gig in the near future in front of lots of people and lights and and some you know, a lady up the front introducing me and I'm standing to the side of the stage just overwhelmingly feeling like I'm a dud and I'm a fraud and today's going to be the biggest fuck up of all time. So I can feel that or sense that or even think that while simultaneously knowing <laughs> that I'm actually okay at this. Yeah. And that, that's just a complexity of the human experience. Yeah, yeah. We've talked a lot about our perception of those kind of biological responses yeah and how they serve but do you think that your your relationship with your knowing or your intuition do you think that makes you a better better in academia like different no No, i don't think so i I don't think it does because like my initial driver for um i don't think it's a hindrance but you know, there's a lot of stuff in, in um, research, of course, that is, is, well, it's all very, very methodical and a lot of it's not exciting. And there's, you know, I'm quite obviously creative and intuitive and instinctive and there's very little room for that in science. Yeah. Some people would argue that, <laughs> but the practical reality of doing research, collecting data and so on, interpreting it, creating new science, getting it published. It, it's not a very creative process compared to creative processes. But um, that, you know, me, the silly joke-telling, storytelling person can coexist with the person who sits and is deeply compassionate for someone who's in front of them, uh, can coexist with the podcast host and the educator and the student and the son who's worried about his mum and dad, you know, uh, the friend uh, can coexist with the egomaniac who gets in his own way and shoots himself in his own foot. Like mm. they're all versions of us. Yeah. Have you ever had a time where you feel like you don't f- follow something you feel a knowing about you feel a sense about you don't follow your instinct and then you wish that you did oh, that's or you fa- can't figure out why that's you're a not very following good question it. that is a oh the answer is definitely yes yeah and definitely that i've thought i should have gone i've felt something and generally gee, uh, okay um Oh, gee, I thought of one. It's not a very, it's a good example, but I don't know if I can. Okay, a long time ago, and this is one of many, but a long time ago, I stayed in a relationship that I knew I shouldn't have. And it wasn't destructive or violent or abusive. It just, but I knew, like I knew early, but I had all of these people around me telling me, you guys are great and blah, blah, blah. But I knew, and it wasn't that this person was not, fabulous or good enough they were all of that 
but I just knew this is not the person I want to spend forever with. Yeah. But I felt guilty and I felt bad. And I remember opening the door, trying to just open the door on the and And I remember just the horrendous outcome. And, and then I felt fucking terrible. And yeah, so the answer is yes. And then when I finally did do that, um, it, it's, I should have done it much earlier. Yeah. yeah. But, but, you know, um, but even, but that sounds very noble, doesn't it? But there's been times when I should have done things and I just didn't because of fear and because of laziness and, you know, avoidance. And yeah, many times, many times when I was, you know, when I owned the biggest personal training business in Australia and I was going home and eating all the food that I was telling everybody not to do because I was essentially a food addict. addict. I was just an ex-fat kid that grew up into be a, you know, a grown up with an ex fat kid mindset and, <laughs> and doing dumb shit and self-destructing and lying and had a toxic relationship with food while pretending to the people that could see that I wasn't that when in fact I was. And that's, you know, like th these are, these are the self-awareness moments that I think um, uh, can be truly transformational but I, I also think this willingness, like for you and I now, like sometimes people go, oh, you're self-deprecating, Harps. You put it, I don't actually say anything. I might say the odd joke, but I think, you know, if I go, I'm just a fuckwit from La Trobe Valley, well, people know I'm mucking around. But, but the stuff that I talk about my shortcomings, I'm not looking for attention or sympathy or support. I'm, I'm actually saying how I am and how I've been. And the reason that I want to be completely authentic around this is because I want people to be encouraged mm. that, oh, he's not special. He's, you know, mm. like I've done some really cool things, but I didn't do really cool things because I'm super fucking talented or gifted or genetically blessed or I had a cheer squad or a support crew or incredible resources. I didn't. I did all of the things that I've done because I just got uncomfortable and, took risks and failed and got back up and failed and wrote a first draft of a book and it was dog shit. So I wrote a second draft and it was dog shit. And I wrote a third draft and it was a bit better. And eventually, eventually I published a book and then another, then another, then another, but I was terrible. You know, the first, I had three podcasts before I started my podcast, which yeah. is now going okay, but I failed three times. Yeah. The first run that I ever did run, as in I'm going to go for a run, I was 14 years old, I lasted 150 metres and I nearly fucking died of a heart attack and I was 14. I literally ran about a third of an oval around and I nearly died and I was that was my first run. And then within four months, I was running 10Ks every day and hardly breathing. You know, but but where I started was 150. Where you start is you start as a white belt and you go, okay, I'm not very good at this and that's all right. But how I get good by accepting where I'm at now and completely fucking throwing all my potential and courage into the process. You know, when I, when I first spoke to Kerry, the thing that surprised me the most is I didn't know her background. So I've got this woman on to talk about communicating with animals. And so she's going to be talking about intuition and instinct and all of the fluff that we don't understand like we are right now. But I couldn't, I couldn't have been happier when one of the first things she said is she spent 17 years as a police detective and you know how many episodes I've done talking to first responders and just relating to their experience of stepping into a life of trauma and what, what drew them into the West. So we had this huge conversation about the familiarity of trauma. So the familiarity for, of a flight, fight or flight environment feels like home. So then we get drawn into this experience. But I was just astounded to think that someone could flip from a 17 years of a job that asks you to suppress your emotions and switch off and not feel and not respond to them to now what she does, which is literally the polar opposite. I was like, it's really nice to know that we can change that. But I think about not knowing what we're in the middle of. So at times when I've been in jobs or positions where once I get out of it, I look back and go, God, that was toxic. I was in the middle. and But how did I not have the awareness when I was in the middle of it? So I like these days to make sure that 
I'm doing things that allow me to step out of it and to have, I don't know, maintain that sense of self, which is weird because you're still yourself, but that's what I was talking about before when I said, this. you know, are there states that prevent us from tapping into ourselves? You know, as you're saying all that I'm and about Kerry and from one extreme to the other and you, I'm thinking, I was just thinking then, how many people are doing the wrong job? I mean, how many people have been in the wrong job, in inverted commas, that's a very big, but for years, like, and where they can do it, they're okay at it, they've got skill and they can execute it, but it's somewhere between I tolerate it and I fucking hate it. You know, for me, that's the wrong job. Yeah. So I, I, it would be, I mean, we can't do it here now, but it would be great to do a conversation or an episode on Roll With The Punches one day um, about finding the right fit, the right job. And, and again, this is not a recommendation or a prescription, but, mm. you know, it's like, and not only the right role and the right job, but for that person, but also perhaps more importantly for that person for that stage of their journey. Because there was a time when me training people on the gym floor and being Craig Harper, the trainer and the loud, you know, and the music and the gym and the fucking all the, the lycra and the bullshit of the nineties and the eighties and then the noughties. And then, you know, but it, for me, it, it had a use by date and it wasn't terrible, yeah. but I got to the stage with that job where I went, I don't like this job anymore. Mm. I still love people. I still, I'm interested in, you know, training and the fitness industry and physiology and getting in shape, but this has run its race. And, you know, I, it would be interesting to, you know, if we could magically have that number of how many people are doing a job um, that they really don't like, and not only they don't like, but it's actually bad for them. It's bad for their mental yeah. and emotional and physical health. And then, and obviously knowing that is not changing that, but, you know, kind of where to, from there because i think that that yeah and, and this is cliche but if literally you can find something which is pretty much a mm. i guess a, an intersection of the stuff that you're interested in and curious about and perhaps love and and want to grow and learn in but also you can make a few dollars doing that well now you don't have a job you just have a passion that has a wage attached to it which is fucking awesome yes the trouble is we we choose things or we match things emotionally and then we tell a story that fits. And my, I remember, I remember recognising my story at one point when I was in sales and laughing at it back then but still not even with all of the links of the chain together but thinking I, I always, you know, when I apply for a job or I talk about my job, why do I love, why do I love sales? I learned to love sales because I was shoved out into it. But, you know, I love, because I loved people, I loved I did hospitality and I loved people and then I went into sales because I love people and I would laugh because I'm like, it's the loneliest job in the fucking world. You're alone. You're alone all the time. I was the one person sales team on the road. I'd go to the mm. office sometimes and I'd go and I'd drop in on brand new, I'd introduce myself to people. That's lonely. That's not connection. That's not people. Yet I'm doing it because I love people. And so there was this, but when I look back at that now, I'm like, yeah, because loneliness was really familiar to me I was just mm. like I was a lonely kid in a mm. lonely world and you know I I did something this week that I used to do when I was younger sh mm. a shitty pattern and when I was younger I used to go out every Saturday night same bunch of people would go out we're in Tassie so there was one nightclub and there was the same people there every time and <laughs> I would work beforehand so I would generally go to someone's house after work late and then we'd go out to the nightclub but each week someone everyone would be like oh do you want to come to with us or do you want to come and i'd always be like i wouldn't commit because i've got commitment issues <laughs> i don't want to schedule stuff in i was like i'll wait i'll wait and then it would get to that day and i'd be like i've got no one to go out with i've got no one and i'd feel really lonely <laughs> i literally did that this weekend i made no plans i wouldn't schedule anything in and then when my day came on saturday or sunday or whatever and i was feeling a bit miserable and a bit flat and mm. I would, and I spent the day shooting out messages to see if anyone wanted to hang out. And I, and I sent eight messages and I was just a sad fucking thing. And I was like, <laughs> you've done this your whole life. This is just another iteration of what you used to do. You 
make sure that you that you're inaccessible to everybody and then you wait to the last minute and then you prove to yourself that you've got no one. Oh, look at you. Yeah, now, mate. Well, like, what's that about? Why oh, do you do that? Well, I don't know. I might talk to Dr. Bill about that. <laughs> you definitely need to talk to Dr. Bill about that. But, but you know, like that we can't, you know, what is really good about that is um, awareness. You know, yeah. it's, it's, we can't change the thing that one, we're not aware of or, mm. or the thing that two, we won't acknowledge. So you're aware, you acknowledge it. Um, you can either languish in it and feel sorry for yourself, which ain't a great plan, or you can go, mm, why do I do this? Because, all, you know, the you being alone on Sunday and, and sending out, you know, that's not the cause, that's the outcome. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. you need to get to the cause. That's not the problem. That's the result of the problem. The problem is why you do that. So, you know, it's like I say to people, you know, people who are struggling with their body who maybe are bigger and heavier than they want to be, I go, well, yeah, that, that is a problem. But in, in many ways, it's really the result of the problem. The, the problem is what's driving you to eat that food and not do that exercise and live that lifestyle which is creating this result. Let's let's talk about the prelim the stuff, the the non-body stuff that creates the physiological outcome. Mm. And again, that's you know, like for you, it'd be be good to do a deep dive on what that's about. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I've been deep Perfect. diving for for fucking almost four decades now, but I'm back into it. We all Thank we're you. all works in progress, love. <laughs> all of us. <laughs> Thanks, Harps. I know you've got another potty, so I'm going to let you go. That was fabulous. You're amazing. I'm definitely not. I'm. 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 I'm just ex fat. See, I'm doing it again. No, <laughs> I. I appreciate that. I try. To, I try really hard, and uh, you're doing a great job. Um, I appreciate you for having me on your show, and uh, you're a gun. Thank you, Tiffany. Thanks, mate. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>